Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And once again, I'm here with uh, Sam Backman. Uh, thanks again for joining me for this discussion, Sam. Thank you for having me yet again. So this is, I think, our third, at least our third uh, dialogue. And um, the last time we talked, we used uh, the empathic listening process. And uh, so we wanted to do that again, just go into uh, reflective listening and empathic listening and see, uh, kind of follow up on our last discussion and talk about, I think it was like you had a topic here. Uh, I think I came up with a few answers on how to co-op cold empathy to induce narcissists and psychopaths to play by the rules. And uh, so perhaps the topic is using cold empathy to induce social conformity in narcissists and psychopaths. So let me just start with reflecting what you want to talk about and uh, what maybe what your experiences were from last time. So just to recap for those who haven't seen the previous uh, dialogues, cold empathy is exactly like normal healthy empathy, but without the emotional component. It's the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes, but without emoting, without feeling that person's feelings, without experiencing the other person's feelings. So, um, in the previous dialogue, I was able to put myself in your shoes. I had no emotional reaction, even when you were describing, you know, some difficult uh, things or when you were expressing your own emotions. I had no emotional reaction whatsoever. I related only to the data that you have, that you have dispensed, but not to the emotional correlate of, of these data. On the other hand, that, that's, so that's on one hand, but on the other hand, you were able to co-opt me, you were able to convince me to empathize with you, because that was your condition for providing me with narcissistic supply, the interview. So it got me thinking that cold empathy can be used to dictate or to convince narcissists and psychopaths to play by certain rules. Okay, well, let me reflect uh, back what I'm hearing so far. That yeah. in our last dialogue, we used the empathic listening, and that you were reflecting, but you were using cold empathy, and you didn't, uh, you, you were just sending back the data that I was sending you, but there was no feeling, you had no uh, feeling attached to that. So you were seeing that uh, perhaps this approach could be used in some way uh, with uh, narcissists and psychopaths to, uh, and, and that's kind of where you are now. Yeah, so um, it seems that if the condition, for instance, if the condition for giving the narcissist narcissistic supply, if the condition for gratifying a psychopath, providing the psychopath with benefits or fulfilling the psychopath's goals, uh, providing the narcissist with attention, modulation. If the condition for all these is that the narcissist and the psychopath empathize with the source of these benefits, with the source of narcissistic supply, etc., etc., I think the narcissist and psychopath would empathize. They would accept this condition, and they will be able to put themselves in the source's shoes, so to speak. It's true that they would have no corresponding emotions. It won't make them more human or more, uh, it, it, it's not uh, the, the real equivalent of empathy, but at the very least it would enable them to see the other person's point of view, which is very rare for narcissists and psychopaths. So kind of conditioned empathy, conditioned empathy, like you want narcissistic supply, you first have to empathize with me, you first have to listen to me, you first have to see me. You want a um, psychopath, you want uh, money, you want uh, some other kind of benefit, you first have to put yourself in my shoes. So making empathy, even called empathy, making empathy a precondition for complying with the expectations and wishes and needs of psychopaths and narcissists, and I'm talking about a therapeutic setting in therapy. Okay, you're saying that uh, perhaps the empathic listening could be used with psychopaths and narcissists in the sense that 
these are the rules that they have to follow. This is the procedure they have they need to follow. But that they're getting the uh, supply, what you call supply, from this uh, process. But in the process, they're having to empathize with the other person. So there's something kind of going on there where they're getting what Which they're is exactly what they're they're getting exactly what you've done mm -hmm. exactly what you've done to me in the previous dialogue. That's exactly what you've done to me. You've you've told me in effect. If you want this interview, you have to play by these rules, and these rules include empathic listening and empathic reflection. These are the rules. It's a take it or leave it situation. So I have leveraged my cold empathy. I have used it in order to listen to you. And I was, actually, I was listening to you, and I was able to see you. That it evoked no emotional reaction in me is, in my view, besides the point because. It was still empathy in the technical sense, only without the emotional component. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that I, I kind of set the rules, and if you are to if you are to have the interview or the dialogue, that those were the rules, and you had to play by the rules, and that it did cause you to uh, empathize with me, because that was the rules of the game in a sense. Yes. Uh -huh. Was there more to that, or did I get that? No, sorry. I, how, what's the sentence? I, I'm finished? Or yeah, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm heard, fully or? heard. I'm fully heard, uh -huh. sorry. Yeah, yeah so um, the one thing that comes to me is I just did a session called Focusing, and it's a process, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a process that was designed, uh, developed by uh, Gene Genlin, who is a student of Carl Rogers. And um, I'll give you a pause here to reflect. If you're wanting to reflect me to that point. Oh, to reflect you. Mm -hmm. I'm terribly sorry. I thought you said I give you a pause to reflect. Oh, uh -huh. I interpreted it like I give you a pause to think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to reflect. Sorry, uh, to reflect you. Uh -huh. Yeah, sorry, sorry. You 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 have mentioned a, a therapeutic presumably process called the focusing, which was developed by Jan Lin, one of Carl Rogers Carl Rogers uh, um, students, and you were about to explain what it is. I I hope. Yeah, and what it is is to for and I actually did the process with someone in Australia who's a focusing uh, teacher practitioner. And what you do is you come into a felt sense, like, what is it that I'm feeling? Like, what is in my body? And I would share the feeling, oh, I have a little anxiety in this part of my body. <clears throat> and the person would reflect back what it was that I was feeling. And, and on the edge of my, you know, how feelings change from one moment to the next. That feeling, if I just stay with it and hear it reflected or hear it, it, it actually changes, and the person would just, and I would keep sharing, what is it that I feel, and they would reflect what I felt. And it was like a whole, uh, a whole journey of emotions would come up, and they would reflect what I was hearing. So I was kind of like wondering what that would be like for you to uh, share what you're actually feeling. What are the sensations in your body? And I would reflect that. You have described focusing sounds a bit like a stream of consciousness. It's a description of inner states. In this case, the inner state of the body, um, or psychological aspects of bodily sensations, such as anxiety and so on and so forth. So one of the participants describes, presumably on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, what's going on with him um, in, in his inner landscape. And the other participant reflects to the first one, what he has heard and what he has uh, understood. So it's it would strike me as kind of a empathic listening, but more more limited to psychological aspects of bodily sensations and so on. Yeah, it, it's focus. Uh, it's on the on the bodily sensations and and the bodily sensations evolve and change and they move. You mm -hmm. can note, I, at least I noticed it move through the body and. And one feeling came up, and then another feeling came up, and it was the sharing. I was sharing those, and I kind of went on this emotional journey with this person, empathizing and listening to me as I went on that journey. 
so you're describing a, 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 an experience you've had with someone from Australia where you have um, toyed, toyed with the focusing, and so you're the, you, you were the one who was describing his inner uh, feelings. But the only thing I don't quite understand is when you say feelings, for instance, I have a pain in my hand, or is it I'm anxious right now? Is it more psychological or more physiological? What is it that you were Yeah, describing? I'm hearing you're wondering about the, what type of sensation. Is it a physical pain or is it a psychological yeah. pain? And it's uh, anything, it's any felt sensation. So it's really about mm -hmm. what is the felt sensation in your body sharing that uh, felt sensation in, in, in real time as it evolves. Mm -hmm. So both physiological and psychological, mm -hmm. anything. And the other person is uh, reflects that uh, to you, and that should create a kind of shared shared experience, I assume. And you're wondering if it's um, a shared experience. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's um, uh, the reason the reason I mentioned that is because you talked about cold empathy. Is you were saying that you had no feeling, and I was wondering mm -hmm. what is the bodily sensation that you have in your body. So that was, it's like, so that, that's, about, that's, what, that's kind of my curiosity is what are the felt experiences that you do feel since you said you had no feeling for in, related to what I was saying, but what do you feel? Right. So my... If you my just want to, re if you just want to reflect um, that, that's first. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm perfect. Okay. My, my statement that I had, that I had no emotional correlate, that I have no, no emotions attendant to my uh, reflection of you, provoked in you the thought of what was it that I did feel? I must have felt something. So what was it that I did feel? And you think that focusing might elicit the, the true picture of what it is that I'm feeling or have felt or, and so on. But just a comment here, perhaps out of protocol, but still very crucial. And I make a distinction between sensations and emotions. And so, sensor or sense, sense input or sense output, sensations are, I would, I would think, more physiological in, in nature. And so, definitely, when I was talking to you, I had, I must have had, I don't recall, but I must have had some physiological sensations. Whether they are directly related or connected to what you were saying, I'm not sure whether they were directly related or connected to what I was saying to you by way of reflecting you. I'm also not sure. But one thing I did not have at all, I did not have emotions in the colloquial sense of the word. Like, I didn't have pity or I didn't have uh, anger and I didn't have uh, love or I didn't have hate. I, I didn't have any, any of the huge panoply of what normal people street, in street talk Call emotions. Mm. So uh, it yeah. is true. Oh. It is. True. Yeah, I did feel. I felt heard up to that point, and I was done. So I'm glad to shift now to listen to you. And so you're saying that you, in in our last dialogue, that you must have had sensations in your body, but you didn't have emotions, and that you didn't have the emotions of love or pity or some other ones. But you did have you you feel that you, you think you probably had some sensations and and you and you differentiate sensations from emotions. I also don't. I also am am not decided in my mind yet whether um, empathic reflection using cold empathy has the same value therapeutic or communicative, communication-wise, whether it has the same value as normal empathy um, used in the same circumstance. So, I don't know if cold empathy is a constricted variant of warm empathy, or is it an entirely different beast, entirely different animal? And if you have a normal person reflecting you, they are bound to use proper empathy. With, with an emotional correlate, with emotional responses. And if you have me, it's more or less like talking to a computer. I mean, I'm sure that could easily, we could easily program a computer to reflect back to you what you have said. 
by changing you know, pronouns and tenses and so on. So I'm not quite sure what is the value added of using cold empathy. But the only thing I'm sure of is that you can use cold empathy to condition narcissists and psychopaths and reinforce certain behaviors. Of that I'm sure. So you're not sure about the relationship of cold and warm empathy in the reflective process? That uh, you could just have a computer that kind of reflects back uh, the the data, the cold empathy, but you're it's you're you have a, you're not clear about the relationship of of cold and warm empathy in a reflective process, and uh, there was another part to it. I didn't. I don't think I got. Uh, yeah, it's okay because I sorry it was very long, <laughs> and uh, but the only thing I am sure of is that this process of empathic reflection or whatever you want to call it, the this process can be used to condition narcissists and psychopaths and to reinforce, reinforce certain behaviors or suppress others. So I'm sure of that. The cold empathy can be used um, to change, to modify the behavior of narcissists and psychopaths in a, in, in a therapeutic setting by providing them with incentives. So it's, if linked, when linked to an incentive structure, it can have, it can have the outcomes can, can be behavior modification. Okay, so you see this empathic listening, we call the empathy circle or the empathic listening, that having that as the structure, uh, you, th you feel that it can actually change a psychopath's or a narcissist's behavior, and, and especially if it's linked to some, some, some kind of an emotion or something that the psychopath and narcissist uh, get. So they feel that they're getting something out of it, and so they're willing to do it, and they have an incentive to do it. And having that training or doing that could be used as a tool to uh, affect the behavior uh, of, of a narcissist or psychopath. I am definitely perfectly correct. <laughs> Um, yeah, you, you, you had mentioned a therapeutic uh, setting, and I'm imagining it in a relationship as well, because we did an empathy circle, and a woman was in it that she actually saw this, this last interview that we did, and she was very taken by it, because she's recovering from two relationships with narcissists. And so she's in a support group and, you know, all women's support group of women dealing with narcissists. So um, you had a, a circle, an empathy circle, in, in which there was a woman who is, is recovering from relationship with narcissists and it does take recovery. <laughs> <laughs> she, has, uh, she has watched the, uh, the latest interview we've, uh, we've done. She was taken by it. I, I, Affected by it, I assume, or impacted mm -hmm. by it, yes. and and um, and uh, yeah. So the point that was, was that was up to that point is that um, now, now you did get that. the 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 point was is that you'd mentioned therapeutic setting, and I'm wondering about. And you were thinking about relationships, and I'm thinking yeah. about relationships, like with yeah. uh, with uh, with a family that. You know, I know a couple of people that say, well, my mother was a narcissist. You know, my mother has some narcissistic qualities, love her dearly. But there, you know, I think, in fact, we all have actually some kind of narcissistic kind of capacity uh, and qualities to us. And maybe even the society is very narcissistic in a lot of sense. So if you can bring into a family situation these an empathy circle, like this is the rules. We're going to spend so much time every day or every couple of days in an em empathy circle where everyone uh, uses this reflective listening as a process. I think it could really do a lot to uh, heal the relationships. So you think we should not confine the, the conversation to a therapeutic setting, but you think it can the, the same principle can be applied in, in a variety of relationships between spouses, between the parents, children, and so on and so forth. You think that if, for instance, uh, there would be an established procedure of uh, having an empathy circle once a day or once a week, doesn't matter, 
and within and in implementing or applying this principle of give and take. You know, you give me empathy, I give you narcissistic supply, whatever. If if this principle can be applied, you believe it would have an, a healing effect on many in many relationships. Yeah, and yeah. that was the main thing was to take it out of just the therapeutic because I, I don't see myself as a therapist. Yeah. I really am looking at cultural yeah. change and I feel that the empathy has kind of got locked away in the therapeutic setting and it really needs to be brought into the the cultural, social setting. You you don't believe that uh, empathy should be confined to therapy alone? You think it's too it's too narrow a setting for empathy? You think empathy is a cultural social thing, and it should be expressed in cultural social um, contexts and uh, settings? Yeah. So you believe that everything we are discussing should be should be applied to a broader canvas, a variety of relationships, society at large, potentially to the culture and so. Yeah. Yeah, I feel fully heard. Thanks. And I want to add that I think intuitively, uh, when you when someone finds himself or herself in a in a relationship with a narcissist, be it with a mother, with a with a spouse, and so on, I think they intuitively do that. I think they very often demand empathy or at the very least demand being listened to and being seen in return for the provision of narcissistic supply or some other benefits. So we know we know in many family situations where, where uh, you would uh, tackle a narcissist in a, in a family setting, yes, you would tackle a narcissist and you would give that narcissist money just to be able to continue to interact with this narcissist, to be to be heard by this narcissist, to be seen by this narcissist, to so you are buying the narcissist called empathy with money, or with other benefits, mm. with attention, with adulation, with admiration, with money, with so these trades, this these trades, these trade-offs or trades, proper trades between benefits and called empathy, I think are already taking place wherever there's a relationship with a narcissist. Mm, so you, you're seeing that there's already kind of a trade going on in, uh, in society between perhaps families and, and, and with narcissists in a family or in any kind of relationship that people are giving the narcissist uh, something in exchange for the narcissist uh, giving back uh, something, some kind of attention or something. So these, are, these trades already happen at some level within society. Yes, I'm, uh, I, I, for instance, because I correspond with many victims of narcissism, and I've been doing it for 17 years now, so by now thousands of them. I know, for instance, that it's a common technique to, for, for a, an abused uh, wife, let's say, uh, with a narcissistic husband. So she gives him adulation, attention, admiration, and so on and so forth, on condition that he pays a uh, kind of notices her, caters to some of her needs, um, puts himself in her shoes from time to time. Like it's, give me a cold supply and I'll give you everything you need. I'll give you narcissistic supply, in the case of a narcissist. Or I'll give you money, if it's a psychopath. Or, or whatever. So I think these, these traits are already taking place. They are not formalized. They are not formalized. And they haven't, in my view, been studied and so on. But I think they're pretty, pretty common. Mm. So these trades already happen uh, in society, that there is some kind of a trade going on with uh, psychopaths or, or narcissists and, and their partners or others. And that they haven't, that these, uh, these trades that go on haven't been studied and that they haven't been made formalized. And it sounds like maybe you're thinking of like doing an empathy circle as a very formalized uh, structure in that way mm -hmm. for, for doing that, for doing those trades. Last point before I'm fully heard is consider, for instance, politicians. There are no, you know, there are no rigorous studies of the prevalence of narcissism and, and psychopathy among politicians. But it stands to reason 
that narcissists would gravitate to politics because they can garner narcissistic supply and 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 uh, yield or wield power over other people, etc., etc. So it's a highly narcissistic profession, politics. It stands to reason that many politicians are narcissists. What is the trade-off that we as a society, what is the trade that we as a society uh, have with a narcissistic politician? We will give you power, we will give you adulation, we will give you attention, we will give you admiration, we'll give you all the narcissistic supply you want, and you, from time to time, put yourself in our shoes, consider our needs, cater to our wishes, see us, hear us. So, the narcissistic politician is participating in exactly this trade, this social trade. He is getting narcissistic supply and he is giving back cold empathy when he considers the needs, wishes, priorities and preferences of his electorate, of the voters. Uh, so you're saying that uh, within society that narcissists might tend towards uh, politics and there's a relationship between the, poli the narcissistic politician and, and the voters, the people supporting them. And that the, that the narcissist is getting power, they're getting adulation, they're getting all these different uh, qualities, and these things that they're getting is what you're calling narcissistic uh, supply. And that kind of the trade-off there is at some point, uh, the voters are saying, you give us some attention to our needs. And so there's... You give us some, you give us some in effect, simulated or called empathy, you know, you, if you need to, even pretend that you care for us, but show us that you care for us. Show us that you do take into account our needs, our priorities, our wishes, our, uh, uh, you know, you, you take care of, uh, if there's a disaster, you are there. I mean, show us, even act. We don't mind. Just, just pretend that you, you're empathizing with us. We know that you're a narcissist. We know that you're incapable of really empathizing, but give us the show. That's also okay. Give us the cold empathy. And I think politicians use cold empathy in their interaction with electorates, voters, and nations. Oh, so the uh, politicians are actually using cold empathy with their uh, with their constituents. And it's almost as if the, the uh, constituents just you know, just put on a show at least of, of having empathy for us, you know, and, and we'll be satisfied with that, even though we, I don't know if you're saying that they're saying that, oh, we know that you're a narcissist, but at least put on a show that you're not narcissistic, put on a show that you do care about us and, and we'll kind of be happy with that. And they're, and they're very pissed off when, when the, the politician doesn't put on the show. So when Bush didn't vis visit Katrina, during the, you know, the, the, after the hurricane and so on, the voters were very angry. So they're very angry when, when something breaks in the theatrical production of cold empathy, mm. the, the voters. That's it, I'm fully heard, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so there's like a show going on. And if the, if the politicians yeah. who, who are narcissists don't kind of con do their part in the show, then the voters get very upset, like with Bush and uh, Katrina. Yeah. That's what you heard. Okay, so. yeah. Then, um, yeah, I, I, what I'm looking, wondering about, again, is, is that felt sense of what does, I'm wondering, what is the felt sense for you of, of cold empathy, what you're calling cold empathy, what does it feel like as bodily sensations uh, to you? Uh, that's a question, or should uh, you I just reflect, reflect the question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, you are wondering what would be the what would be the bodily uh, and psycho psychophysiological reactions while I'm engaging in cold empathy while I'm reflecting back at you uh, using my cold empathy, because I've claimed that there are no emotions, what else am I feeling? There must be other sensations, and you're wondering what they are. Yeah. 
And I'm wondering, like now, even you know, with that focusing, uh, uh, you know, approach, like what is the sensations that you're feeling within your body? Is is what I'm I'm wondering. And I'm wondering if you would be able to be willing to share some of those too. So you're, you're wondering, one, what are the sensations, even in this process that we're undergoing right now, and you're also wondering whether I'd be willing to share them. I feel fully heard. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Yeah, I would be willing to share them, of course. The problem is that there's nothing to share. Uh, when is a... because I'm a narcissist. So when is a, is a narcissist, when I'm focused on obtaining narcissistic supply, Perhaps there is something to share, actually. Wait a minute. I'm, 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 I'm uh, retracking, retracing. Let's start from the beginning. When is a, I, I'm a narcissist, so when as a narcissist I'm focused on obtaining narcissistic supply, I'm more or less, more or less like a laser beam. The, the remainder of reality is excluded, so I'm not aware of my environment, physical or... Uh, so I'm not aware of the room or what's happening in my peripheral vision, and so on. I'm completely focused on obtaining supply, and on my source of supply. And my body is very, very tense. Uh, it's a little like flight or fight reaction. It's, I'm very tense, I'm sure my adrenaline levels are very high, not only in this conversation, generally speaking, but also in this conversation, because for me, it's, it's the main aim of this conversation, the main goal is to derive and extract from you and from the viewers later narcissistic supply. So for me it's a classic narcissistic supply rich situation. So whenever I'm in such a situation, granting an interview or having a conversation such as this one or whatever, I, the closest I can describe it would be flight or fight reaction. So I'm sure that my adrenaline level is very high, I'm sure that I have stress hormones, Coursing throughout my body, I feel stressed, I feel anxious, but goal-oriented anxiety. It's not like diffuse anxiety, but like, this is what I have to do, and I, I am about to achieve it, and I'm about to close the deal. A little like deal-making, you know, like closing a deal. Okay, so for you, yeah, so you, you started talking about some things, and then like, oh, you're not feeling anything, and then you wanted to scratch that, because you did notice some kind of... Uh, a sensation so you aren't to scratch the initial comments and then what you're noticing is that you have a, a laser focus and that that laser focus you exclude other uh, experiences and that you focus on, uh, on on the person or the situation and it's wanting to get some kind of supply and there's a there's a quality of anxiety uh, around that that kind of a and you're and you're saying that the the stress hormones are probably very high because there's a, a bodily sensation of stress, and, but a very deep, a very focus on on the person that you're talking with to kind of get something from them, and that that there's uh, that you're not only that, but also from the viewers, the people who are viewing, wanting to get something from them. So there's a real uh, tense focus, and that you're, I think you're saying that you are feeling that at the moment as well. Yes, I am. So it's a combination of tunnel vision, tunnel vision, mm -hmm. flight or fight reaction, extreme stress, albeit not felt as stress, but now that I'm made to think about it, now that you made me think about it, I notice, for instance, that I'm sweating, that I'm twitching, that I have tics, and so it's extreme stress. Um, narcissistic supply is so critical to me, it is the foundation of my function. Without narcissistic supply, I'm rendered completely dysfunctional. And I need narcissistic supply every second of the day, every minute of, of every hour, 24-7. Otherwise, I crumble. But narcissistic supply is the, the exact equivalent, in my view, of a drug, of drugs, you know. I'm addicted. I'm not an addict. The reactions, my bodily reactions are akin to the bodily reactions of an addict who is on the verge, on the constant verge of cold turkey, going going cold turkey. You know. That's how bad it is. So, and it's all about, not only with you in this conversation, it's generally, this is my state of being. 
I'm like a high strung wire. It's my state of being. This I'm like that all the time. All the time, including in my sleep. Uh -huh. You're talking about your state of being. You're always this high strung state of, of being. And it's uh, you're, you're sweating, you have twitching, it's very highly stressed, and it's always it's like a drug addict who's on the verge of going cold turkey. So it's like you're needing uh, something, or you're calling a supply, and that there's a, a real focus and an anxiety about uh, a, obtaining that. And you laid out a couple of things. I'm not sure if I heard all of those. No, you you no perfect. Uh -huh. You you reflect me perfect. So, and this the last point I'm making uh, before I'm fully heard is that I think that's one of the reasons why it's very difficult for me to empathize, because oh, looks like the uh, connection got two. The uh, connection got a little dropped there. You're saying that uh, right. it was it's difficult for you to empathize because, and then we didn't hear anything. Yeah, I was, I was you know, sorry. I saw the connection, and so I stopped. Okay. It's difficult for me to empathize because empathy, expressing it, experiencing it, sharing it, requires energy, and I am in a constant state of depletion because of this need. To pursue because of this pursuit, because of this need to secure narcissistic supply, attention, uh, admiration, whatever, because of this constant need, I am depleted, and I, I simply don't have energy for other people. I hardly have enough energy for myself. Hmm. You know, so I think that's why I cannot. I think it's a survival mechanism. Like, don't use this scarce energy on someone else. You need all of it, you know. It's like a warning, a red alert. Don't don't do that. You need all of it. Don't. This it's very scarce. Uh, so it's you're in a constant state of, of stress and and uh, on the edge, like you're saying, of, of an addict of of this resource that you don't have, and you don't. And it's a very stressful uh, feeling, and it's it's a wanting, wanting attention, wanting. Uh, the adulation, wanting those uh, feelings to come, that's what you're calling supply, and you don't have the, being in that constant state of stress, uh, you don't have anything to give, I guess, it, it's, uh, you don't have no energy, no energy. there's no energy, you're like on the, it, it's like almost like a survival mode, it's like constant survival yes, mode. I'm, exactly, I'm I'm depleted. I'm simply depleted. Oh, and so feeling that very you, depleted. It's like just no imagine, energy, just totally depleted. Imagine that you hadn't drunk water in, in five days. You haven't had a drop of water in five, I mean, three days, <laughs> to make it more realistic. You haven't had a, a drop of water. Your thoughts, everything, your entire essence and, and quintessence and being and mind, everything would be focused on finding water. I don't think you're going to have energy for, uh, for anything else or for anyone else. I don't think you'll be able to empathize if you're that thirsty. And I'm constantly that thirsty. So you're making an analogy that it's like not having had water for three days. You're just, you're always like so thirsty that you just don't have energy for anyone else. You don't have any space, energy uh, for everyone else. And that you're constantly in that state. Of just not having uh, enough to drink, enough, and so you just don't have any yes. any empathy. Can't have empathy for others because you're in such a state of uh, thirst. Yes, I, I'm fully here. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm I'm wondering, what is it? Is that the state that you're? I'm just wondering. That's the state that you're in now. I guess is is uh, that mm -hmm. state of uh, of thirst. And I'm wondering, how is it? Where is it located in your body? If you look at the landscape within your body, like where are the where is it located? Uh, and and how does how does the landscape shift and move? Um. Having accepted my description of, of um, my need as a kind of thirst or kind of uh, 
having accepted the physiological analogy that I've made to first, you're wondering where in my body does it manifest or express itself most potently, most strongly. And uh, so you ask me where in my body do I feel it most? Yeah, it's more like what is the physical landscape within your within the body? Like where, mm -hmm. you know, where it is, like I, I had some angst when I did this focusing, I was, I just had a fight with my girlfriend and it was, and it was like, I felt this kind of a deep kind of anxiety within my chest and it was almost like a, a nausea. It was like so deep. I almost felt nauseous in terms of wanting to uh, vomit. And and as, as yeah. I shared it, the, the feeling changed and it got bigger and it got smaller and it went to my head and it moved. And I, I was just recounting the physical sensations as they moved and transformed. And uh, so I guess I was just wondering uh, what what it, what's yeah. the landscape of your bodily sensations at the moment? You described an experience you've had while focusing. You said that you had some, you, you had quarreled with your girlfriend, and so you had uh, a very strong anxiety centered around your chest, and you even wanted to, you had nausea, you you felt like throwing up. And But as you progressed with the focusing exercise, you said that it got, it got dispersed, it, it went up to your head, and sort of spread, uh, became less concentrated and more, more spread throughout your body. Then you were wondering what will be the equivalent, equivalent in my case. Yeah, I feel fully heard. If I have to compare my, but one thing is very important to, one distinction is very important to make. You have described a reaction to an event. An event. Your inner state was reactive. My inner state is quintessential is permanent and proactive it's not it's not it has very little to do with the outside world it's there it's my state of being it's existential and if i have to compare it to anything in in psychology it would be to a, a panic attack i'm in a constant state of a panic attack and the panic is would i be able to secure the next dose of narcissistic supply so it's a classic panic attack, you know, simulated chest pains, uh, headaches, a kind of combination stroke and heart attack on a permanent basis. Imagine you were having a stroke or an, and a heart attack combined throughout your life, every minute of your life. That's more or less what I'm going through. So it's very, very, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you just, uh... You're saying that I was reacting to to my girlfriend, and there was like a reactive kind of a quality to it. And what you're saying is that what your state is is like a constant panic attack, where you have uh, chest pains and and different sensations that are involved in panic. But it's a constant given state that you're living, uh, you're experiencing. Yes, and it has to do with the uncertainty regarding my ability to secure the next dose of narcissistic supply. And this ties in with empathy, because sources of narcissistic supply, the vast majority of sources, are human, other human beings, other people. So, if I were to empathize with them, warmly, properly, healthily, I would not be able to objectify them as sources, it would exclude my ability to use them as sources of supply. Because to derive and to extract supply from someone, I need to be manipulative, exploitative. Sometimes I need to lie. Sometimes, I, I, and I always need to create a kind of shared psychosis. So I need to objectify and dehumanize that person. I need to treat that person as a source. That's why I'm using the word source, because source is impersonal, you know. But actually, when I say source of narcissistic supply, I'm referring to other people. If I were to empathize properly and healthily, I would not be able to extract narcissistic supply. And without narcissistic supply, I would crumble to bits and pieces in a split second. Mm. It's existential. My survival depends on my inability to feel empathy. So your survival uh, depends on 
not feeling empathy because it's a sense that if, if you did feel empathy, you would just crumble. And that you, you're calling people, you're, you're trying to objectify people, calling them a source, because that's the way that you can more easily, by objectifying them, it's easier to manipulate them and to get what it is that you want. Exactly. Uh, that means people, people for me are sources of gratification, objects. I must dehumanize them. I must denude them of their humanity in order to convert them to sources of supply. And if I weigh, if I weigh empathy, being having healthy empathy with narcissistic supply, narcissistic supply is far more important to me than the need to be normal or healthy or feel empathy. I need narcissistic supply above everything else. There's nothing I will not do for narcissistic supply. And there is no one I will not do anything to if, I, if I'm in need of supply. It's exactly like a junkie, you know. Junkie, junkies would rob their own mother to, to, to obtain the money to buy, to buy the next dose. There's no empathy there. It's a drug addiction. Uh, so you're really making it analogy to drug addiction that the the need for the the supply adulation attention and, and whatever all those different feelings is so uh, great that you would do anything for that especially since if you don't have that you would kind of cease to exist you you would fall apart and so if you were weighing having empathy for someone or just kind of getting something from them uh, the, from the source that you would always choose uh, the uh, supply because uh, trying to get that from people because if you don't, you would fall apart. And yeah. and finally, before I'm fully heard, don't forget that I have been objectified and dehumanized. I have been treated as an object and I have been severely abused in my early childhood. So I have learned, I have learned that this is the way people relate to each other. They objectify and dehumanize and abuse. It, I, it has become my modus operandi. It's something that I grew up in. I was conditioned to be a narcissist. It didn't just happen, you know, it's, it was a process. Acquired. Mm -hmm. So you're just tying it uh, back to your childhood, which we had talked about before, that that uh, you were in an environment, in a narcissistic environment, and you were conditioned uh, toward to that. And that's, it didn't just happen. It's like it was, it was a conditioning that kind of brought you to the situation that you're in. You told me about your childhood, and yet you, you did not become a narcissist. I wonder if you can a bit elaborate on that. Yeah, so I had talked about my childhood, and I didn't become a narcissist. You're saying, and if I would elaborate on that, you're you're saying, yeah, I'm fully here. If you care to, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, my my parents uh, came from Germany uh, through, you know, for, they were refugees, uh, so they went through a lot of really difficult situations. Um, my father, he was in what was. was northern poland what's now in northern poland in east prussia and when the russians came in uh, he was hid in the barn and they killed everybody in his family your, uh, i asked you about your childhood and so you you began by giving some, a bit of a background on your on your parents you said that your parents were were germans essentially who lived in eastern poland uh, the Dansk or something, probably, um, and uh, as the Russians invaded, um, they killed your father's entire family while he was hiding in a barn. So that must have been, I don't know how old he was, but that must have been an extremely traumatic experience. Yeah. I mean, it, I suppose I suppose he heard it or witnessed yeah. it in some way. Yeah, so, and yeah, he went, you know, after they were all killed, you know, he went into the house and saw them, you know, all shot and I mean, it, it's even worse than that in terms of his sister was still actually alive. And, um, 
she had said, you know, when the, when the soldiers come again, I'm going to ask them to shoot me because she had been shot through the spine, was paralyzed. And so he went and hid. And then, you know, later some more soldiers came and he, he heard a shot. So she was actually um, shot. And, and so anyway, so that was quite a, quite a, you know, horrific uh, experience for him. Then he was in a Russian concentration camp. Um, later he was caught. And so and then for, you know, like six, seven, ten years was a refugee and eventually immigrated to the United States. So you, the the case, or I mean, the, the case was even worse than than you described before, and you gave additional details as to mm -hmm. what has happened there, which must have must have rendered the whole the whole event even much more traumatic than, than I thought. Yeah, and then uh, and oh, uh, so and and then you indicated that uh, your father you, you told you told me that your father ended up in a Soviet concentration camp which uh, must have been a, a horrible experience. And then he, later on, he became a refugee, but then finally he emigrated to the to the United States. So there was a, a, a sizable chunk of his childhood and adolescence where he spent in the most horrifying, traumatic environment conceivable. Yeah, and the same uh, with, with my mother, who, um, they were in another part, they were in, my father was in a German part of what's now Poland, and my mother was in the Polish uh, part. And uh, the same, similar thing happened when the Russians came in with her and her family, except it was all just women and, you know, children. But there was, you know, like gang rapes, you know, all kinds of really horrible uh, kind of situations, you know, happening uh, with them as well. And, you know, refugees and really being abused as they were, as, you, as when, when, you know, ethnic groups are kind of kicked out of a country, like they were kicked out of uh, Poland, there's all kinds of abuse along the way, just like happened in India or anywhere else. So your mother came from a similar background to your father. She also um, has went through her own personal ordeal, which being a woman was different to your father's, but still equally traumatizing and, and horrible. And um, she was from another part of uh, Poland, but still, when the Russians came in, they deported all the Volksdeutsch, all the mm -hmm. Germans who, who lived there. And uh, so they both come from extremely, ex I mean, extreme traumatic experiences. Yeah. So um, for my mother, you know, I think this really affected her. And she has a kind of a quality where it's really hard to kind of, when talking with her, to really have her here. You know, I mean, and it changes, but it's, there, there's kind of a little of a bit of a narcissistic uh, quality to it uh, in that it's almost like she doesn't know anything else. It's like she'll just talk and talk. And if I'm talking, she doesn't really hear. It doesn't feel like she really hears always, you know, what I'm saying. And it's all, like she always has to talk. You know, she always needs kind of attention. And um, so it's a little, you know, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's somewhat narcissistic in that sense. Before I reflect you, just to fully understand, she talks, uh, the, the things she, say, she says have anything to do with what you are talking about? Or no, it's own? like she'll, she'll talk okay. and talk and talk and talk. And then she says, why aren't you saying anything? And I'll say, okay, well, I'll start talking. And then as soon as I start talking, she starts talking again. You know? And so it's like I almost give up. Like I'm not going to say anything because, you know, it's like she'll just talk over me, you know. It's like not really listen. So so you feel that uh, probably owing to her life experiences, um, it's very difficult to conduct a true dialogue with, with your mother in which you will be heard as well as here. Um, you feel that your mother is incapable to effectively listen to you and hear what you're saying, or even to let you speak. Yeah, she tends she tends to dominate and monopolize the conversation, and she, she talks over you and and so on. And you believe that that this might indicate some narcissistic trait, or, or that it might be a narcissistic behavior. Yeah, and and I understand that where it comes from from all this trauma, you know, kind of growing yeah, up. I said, so, I said, yeah, I said. Yeah. So, um, 
What was interesting is I've been trying to listen more because my family is, you know, evangelical Christians, so very conservative. Uh, and, you know, I'm kind of, I was more on the progressive side. So I've been, at least when I growing up, I had a lot of fights and arguments with them, you know, about ah, I'm right, no, you're wrong. And so, was, and so kind of one way I dealt with it was to get into kind of a fight mode. But then as I learn more about empathy, I've been trying to just hear and empathize uh, with them more. Uh, your family are evangelical Christians and you found yourself on the more progressive end of the, of the religious spectrum. And so inevitably, and probably also because you were an adolescent, it's typical behavior, uh, you were a bit. Um, you, you found yourself involved in in conflicts and and debates and and arguments and and so on. And at the beginning, you reacted by being very combative, by by fighting back and you know uh, insisting on your position and so on. But later on, you have acquired, uh, you have decided, or you have acquired uh, skills of listening, empathizing, being able to absorb what the other party was saying, and and so on. So, and. I understood from you, at least implicitly, implicitly, that this whole history has led you to your interest in empathy and in listening and in reflection and, and so on. Yeah, it was actually, I, uh, right after, you know, I was about 17, 18, I took off traveling and traveled around the world for 10 years. So kind of had a lot of adventures, learning, you know, being with a lot of different people. So I think that really kind of changed uh, me uh, a lot too. Yeah, so in your late adolescence, you embarked on a kind of trip around the world, and you you you've come across different people, different cultures, different sensitivities, and so on and so forth. And you think this has formed you, this has uh, this has made you more amenable and and even susceptible to other people's points of view and what they what they have to say. And so yeah, on. you became a better better listener. Yeah, and really valuing uh, empathy. And then, uh, so I really try to bring it into the family now uh, in terms, and there's a lot of stories I could tell about how successful it's been because it's been really quite successful in terms of, of strengthening the connections. And but I don't want to go on too long because I want you to have a chance to share too. So No, no, I don't mind at all. It's fascinating, actually. Oh. Um, so you say that you, you are now applying the skills you've acquired as far as empathy goes in, uh, within your family circle and you believe that it has had a positive effect in some respects, yeah. enhancing communication possibly and, and other effects. Yeah. So you're pretty happy that you have chosen to do that. Yeah, for one story then since you're willing to go on, <laughs> that yeah, yes, yeah, there, there was a conflict story between my sister-in-law and my mother. There was like a a real argument started and they were pointing fingers and don't talk to me that way. And like just, and this was on Christmas uh, day, you know, the evening and it looked like everything was going to blow up. And then I kind of stepped into it and it was kind of a terrifying experience, but I started empathizing with both sides. So to my sister-in-law, I started saying, Oh, I'm hearing you say this. I'm hearing just the reflection, which we're doing, which you and I are doing now. And she mm -hmm. started calming down. And then I started, doing the same thing with my mother, kind of doing the empathic listening. And we just kept going back and forth for almost 10 minutes. I was empathically mirroring both of them. And so I'll let you catch up to that point. You, you just described a, an, an incident or an instance of, uh, of using these skills that you have acquired, where your mother and your sister-in-law had an altercation on Christmas Eve and to prevent an all-out disaster, you stepped in and you started reflecting both parties uh, to, and by saying, you know, I hear you, I hear that you're saying this and this to your sister-in-law, exactly. and then similarly to your mother, and the tension abated and, and confrontation was about. Oh no, that's, that was only, a, it only abated a little bit. Then once it abated a little, enough, oh, I asked them to start talking to each other and saying, would you now speak with you know each other mm -hmm. and reflect back and don't shift until the person feels fully heard so kind of the empathic listening that we're doing and they said oh okay mm -hmm. and then one would start sharing 
And then the other one would want to react right away. And I said, no, no, we have to wait until she feels fully heard. And she says she's fully heard before it's your turn to speak back. And so I kind of created that uh, dialogue with them. I had to kind of keep it on track because they would want to always react. And then the whole family gathered around and it turned into this whole family empathy circle. Mm -hmm. So you impromptu, you on the spot kind of taught your sister-in-law and your mother how to do empathic listening. You introduce them to the ground rules, you know, you, you, you can uh, you can't talk until the other person said that he's fully heard, she's fully heard, and so on. And so they tried it, and and it seemed to work to some extent. And then the, the rest of the family joined in, and it became a family-wide empathy circle in which these techniques of empathic listening and empathic reflection and so on were used by presumably by everyone. It, I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and and just the last piece that I'll put in there. But with, with, with my mother, she would start, she would talk and talk and talk and talk. And it was like, you know, say so much. And she tells stories that kind of weave and wind and, and she goes on and on. So I said to her, when you tell stories that are, are so long, I get lost. Can you reflect what I said? She says, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> it was too long, way too long. <laughs> ten word sentence, ten word sentence, way too long. So uh, your mother tends to go on tangents and and you know weave uh, complicated thousand and one night stories and so on. And and uh, so you told her when you when you do this, I get lost and I I I don't see the point or I keep missing the point and so on. And then you asked her to reflect what you had said. And she said that she had forgotten yeah. what you and said. And then I said it again. I said, when you tell long stories uh, like that, I get lost. And then she says, "And can you reflect that? She says, oh, I'm so confused. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was wondering how she, how she fitted in, because you said she was much better at talking than at listening. And listening is a crucial component of uh, empathic listening, yes? So I was wondering how you, and you kind of answered it. So you, you said that you, you repeated the sentence again to her and asked her to reflect it, which seemed to have confused her. And she said, I'm confused. That was her reaction. Yeah, and I had to repeat it like about five times until she finally could just say the simple sentence of, oh, when I tell long stories, you feel confused. I mean, just that little part, sure. you know, but she did say it eventually, you know, so it was, it's, it's that, you know, finally had to kind of train her to, you know, not be so absorbed in what's going on in her, but to be able to listen to others to, and be able to hear and reflect them. So, I mean, that's just, this is just one story out of a lot of stories of how I'm kind of bringing the empathy into uh, my family is having really great effects in healing a lot of the, I don't know, dysfunction, I guess, or dis, mis, dis, miscommunication. Right. So, um, having failed twice, you persisted. You, you kept repeating the sentence until she got it and was able to reflect accurately the contents, at least, of the sentence, if not the verbiage. Um, so, and, and you said that this is a, just one example of many in which you are implementing these principles, and in this case, uh, in the family circle, and to good effect. Yeah. To good, uh, to good effect. Yeah, so I, I feel fully heard with that. Um, yeah, I feel fully heard. Your mother's story is very interesting. Assuming for a minute, although she hasn't yet had, I mean, she hasn't been diagnosed by anyone and so on, but assuming for a minute that she does have some narcissistic personality style or narcissistic traits or behaviors. It's a very interesting case because no one fails to repeat a very simple sentence, you know, unless they are resistant to that sentence, unless there is some psychological resistance involved. It's not like you read to her the entire Pentateuch or Bible. It was a simple sentence. Uh, she's presumably an intelligent woman or sufficiently intelligent to repeat the sentence. So, when she said, I'm confused and so on, these are, these are typical manifestations of strong psychological resistance. And 
you asked me to be honest in, in this conversation, and it's a prerequisite, and it's a rule of the game, so I abide. So do I. I also feel resistant. Throughout this conversation, so that's where your mother and I tie in. Uh, I have a very strong incentive to collaborate with you. So that's why I'm suppressing my resistance. But it doesn't mean it's not there. And my resistance wears many forms. But maybe I'll stop here to allow you to reflect. Uh, on so you're saying that, uh, that my mother has resistance to doing the reflection and that you're seeing a parallel mm -hmm. to your situation that on one hand, you're willing to do the reflection, but on the other hand, that you have a real strong, you're feeling a constant uh, resistance to the reflection. Yes. Uh, as I said, I have a very strong incentive to proceed uh, and abide by your rules. Um, and that incentive is not since it's supply. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm not feeling resistant. And so the resistance wears many forms. So I question the sagacity, I question the wisdom of engaging in this kind of exchange. Couldn't we have been much more, uh, much more fruitful? Couldn't we have been much more constructive using another type of, of exchange? I'm uh, questioning, um, I'm questioning my ability to be sin fully sincere. Not that I'm lying or, or misinforming you, but I'm questioning my ability to be aware of, of the truth in me. Uh, so I, I don't know how, how productive and how truthful it is. So, but all these are forms of resistances. They, they, all these are kind of I'm trying to find an excuse to break it off uh, because I, I am averse. I am averse to touchy feeling. <laughs> touchy feeling, you know. It's, I'm really averse. To but on the other hand, I have a very strong incentive, you know. I think this series is very, very interesting. Not only the viewership, not only narcissistic supply, but I think we are, we are creating something interesting. I don't want to say unique, but interesting, you know. People, the viewership numbers prove it, I and mean, people find interest in it. So I, I would feel it would be a great shame and pity to break it off just because I have some psychological resistances which are related to my narcissism because I am the I'm I'm the omniscient. I'm the omnipotent. I'm the I'm the I'm the boss. I'm the alpha male. I'm you know and so. But here you're forcing me to be your equal, and I'm abiding by this rule. I am your equal, but it it generates of course uh, narcissistic injury of some kind and, and so. So what I'm saying is these resistances are in the background. In they rear their heads, ugly heads, not ugly heads, but they rear their heads repeatedly. You asked me to describe what's happening inside me. So that's one thing that's happening inside me. This concept, what is it doing? Can't we do it differently? <laughs> is it the right thing to do? Um, you know, I, this, all of that is happening. Uh, so you're recounting what's happening inside inside yourself, and you're, you're finding that, uh, on one hand, you know, you're willing to do this empathic listening, but that there's an ongoing kind of a resistance, and that resistance kind of manifests itself in different ways. Uh, comes up, I think you even say rears its head or ugly head or whatever, and that uh, and one of the resistance that you're feeling is, well, couldn't we be doing this a different way? Isn't there some other way of, of doing this? Um, there was another resistance. Uh, what, there was, yeah, there was a couple. There was, yeah, there's just different yeah. ways of resisting, like, you know, right. yeah, that but you had different just, ones, just, but I'm not sure I got each of those. Was yeah, something. they're not very important. Let's uh -huh. just get examples. But one minor, uh, one minor correction or point that I didn't make clear is that it's not that I'm willing to do it. It's not that I'm acquiescing or I'm coerced. I, I want very much to do it because I think what we are creating oh. is not only is not only a source of supply but is value. So I want to do it. I'm looking forward to doing it. But I cannot suppress my my narcissistic injury, my resistances, my, my grandiose uh, reactions, my, you know, I, my rage, I cannot suppress. So it's like I'm, I have a multiple personality, like I have two personalities. One of them, one personality wants very much to work on it and sees value in what we're doing and so on. And the other one keeps nagging at the first personality and saying, what is it that you're doing? Isn't it stupid? Why are you doing this? Couldn't you do, have done it much better? 
Couldn't you have done it differently? Is this the right thing to do? Aren't you wasting time, etc., etc.? And this, by the way, is the constant state of the of the narcissist. This duality. It's a constant battle between the false self, which is a concoction, an invention, and other elements in the personality that are suppressed. And, and so there's always this kind of multiple personality disorder going on. And it is tied to empathy, but that's the next part. Uh, so you're saying it as kind of actually two, it's like almost like person at different personalities. One is like is, um, oh, my screen. One is, is wanting to do this because you see that it might have some benefits and wanting to kind of explore it and try it and do it, uh, doing the reflective empathic listening. And then the other is like, well, isn't there other ways, you know, kind of the, more the sense of wanting to be grandiose or, or you know, just these other, this other parts. So you have these two parts that are kind of going back and forth between each other. And then you're seeing that as uh, something part of, of, of uh, the narcissistic experience that, that you have of yes. always being kind of on that yes. edge between the two. Yes, this inner conflict, inner conflict is the kernel. It's the kernel of narcissism, in my view. Uh, so this and conflict this between these different ways of being you're seeing as the kernel of, of, yeah. of narcissist experience. Uh, yeah. Narciss narcissists are shattered people. They are fractured people, fragmented. Uh, but this ties in with empathy, which is the last part of, of this round, of my round, uh, before I'm fully hurt. This ties in with empathy. If I do empathize with, if I, if I, if I were, if I choose to empathize with people properly and healthily and so on, I would sacrifice. I would have to sacrifice my narcissistic defenses. I I have defenses against this inner fragmentation, and the defenses are: I am perfect. I am brilliant. I am omnipotent. I am omniscient. I am you know. These are the defenses. I know that I'm a broken vessel. I know that I'm damaged goods, but to defend against that, against this extremely painful realization, I have these narcissistic defenses. We call it compensatory narcissism. I compensate. But if I empathize with another person, then I can't be omnipotent. If I'm equal to you, to, to empathize with you means to be you to some extent, to be equal to you, to, to be able to, to, be put, to put myself in your shoes means that you and I are interchangeable. But how can we be interchangeable if I'm godlike? If, I, if I'm omniscient, if I'm omnipotent, definitely you're not omniscient. You're not omnipotent, I am. So, if I empathize, I have to sacrifice my narcissism. If I sacrifice my narcissistic defenses, I experience this inner fragmentation and shattering, which is a pain beyond description. It's, uh, it's life-threatening, definitely, life-threatening. I believe that if I lose my narcissistic defenses, I will commit suicide. My narcissistic, narcissistic defenses guarantee my life. They stand between me and the overwhelming pain that is the world. If I, it, to, and to empathize, I need to sacrifice this. I need to remove them, thereby exposing myself to potential mortal danger. So there's a, you're seeing there's conflict between yourself and that you, with between parts of yourself, and that you create a kind of protection uh, uh, for yourself. And uh, if you were to remove the protections, that you would kind of shatter and totally be like you're you'd commit suicide because the because it's so I don't know if it's it's I don't, there's some yeah for some reason so painful there's so much pain that you would create, uh, you would commit suicide. So you have to have, you have these defenses and it's re you're relating it to empathy because uh, the, uh, I guess one of the defenses is that you're kind of superior and godlike and, and uh, you know, above everyone else. And that to empathize, it puts us on an equal uh, kind of a footing, an equal space. And that's, uh, maybe threatening, or or it has potential to <laughs> bring up the pain, uh, bring bring up the pain, and that pain is so overwhelming that to experience that you would maybe just commit suicide rather than deal with that pain. So you have all these defenses kind of built up uh, to kind of avoid uh, that pain. 
And like every defense, it isolates you from the world. What is a defense? What is a defensive wall? What is a castle? It's, it isolates you from the... It doesn't allow you to access other people and doesn't allow other people to access you. Hence, the lack of empathy. Lack of empathy is a derivative of narcissistic defenses. It's, a, it's an inevitable outcome of narcissistic defense. That's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no so the, uh, hmm. the uh, defenses that protect yourself actually create a wall against connecting with others and empathizing with, with others because you have to protect yourself, but that protection creates uh, this disconnect and lack of empathy with uh, others. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fully here. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the, the one thing that came up to me was I'm willing to empathize with every part of you in that sense. Like, you know, that part, the other part, the wall part, the pain part. So for me, the empathy is to uh, empathize with all the different parts and that they're all fine. You know, it's like I have, they're all kind of equally uh, valid and worthy worthy of being empathized with. Uh, you say that you make no, no discrimination or you don't discriminate between the various parts of me in terms of your ability and willingness to empathize with them. You're willing to empathize with all the structures and constructs that together make me. That would be the pain, the wall, the defenses, the, and, and everything else. You see no problem with empathizing with any of these parts and all of them put together. Yeah, they're, they're all valid parts of the human experience. They're all, yeah, well, <laughs> no need to reflect that. They're all valid parts, yes. Right. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's... Uh, that's what's coming. I'm also thinking about the time. We've we've gone for a little bit over almost an hour and a half. We had a little setup time. Yeah. So I'm not sure how I've, I'm I'm fine with continuing the conversation again. Um, so, so much. I would like to discuss next time, if, if you're amenable to suggestions, mm -hmm. I would like to discuss next time. I'd like to compare. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the keywords human experience. You know. I would like to try to compare your human experience with my human experience. Uh, I'm a human being. Despite appearances, I'm a human being. And, and you're a human being. So we are different types of human beings. Um, I've been diagnosed as, as a narcissist, so I have a different human experience. I would like to try to compare them, maybe using some empathy techniques. Because I think my inner experience is dramatically different to yours. And, well, I hope so, at least, for you. <laughs> so it raises, the, it raises the question, in which sense are we both human? What is it that, what's a common denominator? What is our humaneness, if, if we're that radically different? So first we have to establish if we are radically different. And if we do discover that we are radically different, as we are being told by psycholog psychology textbooks and so on, then in which sense are we both members of the same psychological species? In which sense are we both human? And of course, this, this is the core of empathy. It's, ex it's exactly the, it's the main, the crux of what is empathy. You know? Because if there is no common humaneness and human experience, if we have no common denominator, then how can we empathize at all? Maybe we're misleading ourselves, deluding ourselves. You know, in psychology, there is the issue of intersubjectivity. So many, many philosophers, sorry, many philosophers say that it is not possible to empathize. Ipso, ipso facto, that means by, it's not, uh, it's not possible at all that we delude ourselves into believing that we can empathize. But actually, it's not possible because our minds are not accessible, and we are using private languages, and no dictionary exists between us, etc., etc. So there is this phase of philosophical consideration. You don't have to reflect me, I'm just talking about future, the future talk. If you are up to it, we can try to compare human experiences and discover what is it that unites us, what is the bridge between us, that allows us to empathize with each other, and maybe we'll discover that there is no such bridge. That Empathy is excluded, uh, you know, between the two of us because of a narcissist. And maybe we will discover the common denominator, the bridge. 
that allows you to cross over to me. And maybe in reverse form, allows me to cross over to you. I think we need to tackle our humanness. What makes us human? Uh -huh. Well, I will reflect. You said you were saying I didn't need to reflect. Um, is that we can have another dialogue and kind of and look at what is how how are we, we different or how are we the same and is there some kind of a a connection there and really kind of explore what is the qualities that we have and what are our experiences and where do they where do they uh, maybe if we go deep enough where is the humanity the, the that common humanity and then you're bringing up uh, maybe even it's not even possible to empathize as some philosophers to say that that's something that's not even uh, a possibility. So keep keeping that uh, an awareness of that too, but to kind of do an exploration of really hearing where we are, uh, understanding who we are as, as people, as humans, as human beings, yeah. and as human beings and where is this, uh, maybe where is the overlap in our humanity? But it's, but it's in our case, you and me specifically, it's going to be pretty unique because I am a narcissist. Part of the definition of pathological narcissism is severe deficiency in humanness. So I'm like a quasi-human, <laughs> pseudo-human, not full-fledged human. It's a little like you would have an alien. It's a little like having an alien on the other end and trying to see whether you can empathize with an alien in effect. It's an interesting question. Can you empathize with an alien? You know? uh, you're saying so that you're, this, you, see, you're, you see yourself as a, well, you're, you're, uh, as a narcissist, that you're, as an, you're an alien, and it's like an alien, and is it possible to empathize with an alien? Is that even yeah. a possibility? Do I have in me sufficient residual, sufficient residue of humaneness that will allow you to really empathize with me, understand me, and communicate with me effectively? Or am I so removed that I am from Mars and no empathy is possible? Uh -huh. so, so is there, I, is there something, is there a humaneness within you or are you so removed from this humanity that you're like from Mars, from like a totally different space and is that even possible to uh, empathize with you? Because, because psychology textbooks uh, uh, claim that both psychopaths and narcissists miss, miss critical dimensions, critical parameters of, of being human. Empathy, but not only empathy, you know. So they claim, it's not my claim, they, they claim, these authorities in psychology, they claim that narcissists and psychopaths are partly human or deficiently human, or whatever. So that's why I think the conversation between us could be, could be of great interest. It's not like two normal people trying to find the common denominator. It's like a normal person and something as close to possible to an alien as you can get on Earth. <laughs> so this could be an interesting conversation because it would be with a normal person, what you're calling a normal person, and something that's like an alien on Earth. And that there's philosophers yeah. or academics or whatever are saying that, you know, narcissists, psychopaths don't have this, these uh, capacities or empathy. And, and so what, what will kind of happen uh, next? Yeah. yeah, I'm fully heard and I think we are fully, we are fully done as well. Yeah, I think so. Well, that was great. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll set a schedule and uh, continue the uh, conversation. And it, so I'll... Uh, Thank you for Absolutely. spending Thank this you. time. And with that, I'll actually stop the uh, recording. So Thank stay you, tuned. Have a good day, then. You too.